Now let us look at another kinds of contract such as insurance contract and credit default swap. Insurance contracts are used as a hedge against any unexpected loss or event. So if there is any adverse event which occurs, the investor will be paid a lump sum amount which is determined in the advance. So the example could be motor insurance, life insurance, etc. Similarly, the credit default swap is also a kind of insurance which makes payment to the buyer if the issuer is unable to pay the interest or the principal of the bond. So in those cases, he is paid back a fixed amount. So that is how the credit default swap is a hedge against default risk. Now let us move to the next slide. The types of financial intermediaries. As we already know that financial intermediaries are the medium of communication between buyers and sellers in the financial system. So they basically connect the people who can provide capital and the people who can use the capital provided. So or in other words we can say buyers and sellers. So intermediaries are the medium of communication between the two. The first kind of financial intermediaries are brokers. So brokers generally do not take their own positions. They simply execute the trades on behalf of their clients in a cost effective manner. Then there are block brokers. They usually execute large orders. And the main objective is to reduce the market impact cost because generally if the order is very large, they can move the market in one direction. So the cost of the purchase or sale will rise. That is why the block brokers are used. So they discreetly send the order so that the market impact cost is minimum and the market does not move the adverse direction. Now third kind of financial intermediaries are investment banks. So they help their clients to raise capital by issuing either shares or bonds. They also help in acquisition of other companies. So if a large investor or private equity fund or a large company has excess cash and they want to buy stakes in a company, they can use the services of investment bank or if a company needs capital through shares or bonds, then also they can take help of investment banks. Then we have exchanges where the shares, options, bonds and other instruments are traded. So they are basically bringing the buyers and sellers together and they have to follow the regulations decided by the exchange. Then we have alternative trading system which is a non-exchange trading platform where the buyers and sellers are meeting each other but there are no regulations like an exchange. For example, the electronic communication network is an alternative trading system. Let us look at a few more financial intermediaries. Dealers. We know that the brokers execute the orders for their clients. They do not take their own position. But dealers buy and sell and they keep their own inventory. So if an investor wants to buy, he can go to the dealer or if he or she wants to sell, they can approach the dealer and get the trade done. So basically dealers are providing liquidity to the market and they make profit from the spread. So if somebody wants to buy, he has to buy at ask price and somebody wants to sell, he has to sell at the bid price. For example, a dealer will quote a price as 100, 100.5. So this is bid, this is offer or ask. If an investor wants to buy, he has to buy at 100.5 and if somebody wants to sell, he has to sell at 100. So 0.5 will be the gain of the dealer, that is bid ask spread. So that is how they make profit in return of providing liquidity to the market. Then we can have broker dealers, the intermediaries who are playing both the roles. So they also keep inventory with them, but they execute the trades also on behalf of their clients. But it would create an adverse situation because there are two objectives which are conflicting here. A broker would want the client to get the best execution price, whereas the dealer wants to maximize his own profit which he is getting from the trade. So these two objectives will clash with each other. So they has to be a balance. Then we have one specific kind of dealers, primary dealer. 
who are dealing with the central bank. When a central bank wants to buy or sell government securities in order to increase or decrease the liquidity in the market, they use primary dealers. Then we have securitization. Then we have securitizers. These intermediaries create a pool of securities and the small interest in the pool is sold to a small investor. So it creates not only liquidity but also generates return which is not possible if an individual investor is investing in that security. So assets which are securitized could be mortgages, car loans, credit card payments, bank loans etc. So the payments which is expected from these instruments is transferred to a pool from that an investor is given return. So thus the securitization is helping an investor to generate return from these kind of products. And the primary benefit of the securitization is decreasing the funding cost for the asset in the pool. So one form could be a special purpose vehicle which has been separated from the balance sheet of the company. So because of the securitization the cost of borrowing for that company is reduced and since it has been removed from the balance sheet the risk that could have arisen from the default has been transferred to SPV. So that ha risk has been reduced for the company. Let us look at a few more intermediaries. The depository institutions. So this may include banks or credit unions etc. So they pay an interest on the deposit and provide certain services for example checking account etc. In addition to that they also help in evaluation of credit quality and management of risk for a portfolio. Then as we already seen there are insurance companies who are just a hedge against an adverse event. So they also play a role of intermediary who provide risk reduction to the insured and in return they get the premium for doing this service. So that is how they are giving protection to the investors against a risk or unforeseen event which is already present in the insurance. But for insurance companies there are certain risks. First is moral hazard. This problem arises as we know when one person or a, an asset is insured then the person may take more risk because he has already transferred that risk to a insurance company. For example if an house is insured then the house owner may not be very careful about the safety of the house because the risk has been transferred to the insurance company. The second problem is the adverse selection. So the people who are most likely to experience losses if somebody is already expecting a loss on the house then he can get the house insured or if somebody is facing a health issue he or she might be interested in life insurance. So that is a adverse selection problem for insurance company which might increase the payment from the insurance company. And the third problem is fraud where the insured purposefully cause a damage to claim the insurance money. This is also a common problem. Another kind of intermediaries are arbitragers. So they keep looking for an arbitrage opportunity. So if there is an asset which is priced differently in two different markets, they buy where it is cheap and sell where it is expensive. So this buying and selling gives them an arbitrage profit. And to the market they are providing liquidity. Let us move to the next slide. Clearing houses. This is another important financial intermediary which acts as a medium between buyers and sellers in financial market and they could provide these services. First is escrow services. So they can open an escrow account where the two parties may agree on the condition of payments to one party under certain circumstances. So that is already communicated to both the parties and the clearing house. Then there could be a service of guarantees 
on any contract completion or there could be an assurance that margin traders have adequate capital so the clearing house can give that assurance that in case the margin falls it will be given to the clearing house and it takes the responsibility of the successful execution of the trade and the payment then they can provide limits on the aggregate net orders the quantity of the members since they have information about the capacity of the trader or member so that is how the clearing house limit the counterparty risk since they are giving the assurance that both party are liquid enough they will be able to provide the payment in case of an adverse movement so they are limiting the counterparty risk then we have custodians which help in safeguarding the financial asset and preventing any loss due to any fraud now let us move to the next topic which is the position which an investor can take they could be of two kinds long position or short position so when a person owns or hold a security and he is gaining because the price will rise so that is called a long position for example if a person has bought an asset now if the price of the asset moves up the person will gain if it comes down he will make a loss so that is a long position similarly if the person has bought a call option the price of call option will increase when the price of underlying increase we know that call price is directly proportional to underlying asset so if you have bought the call option you have a long position similarly if you have sold put option again we know the price of put option is inversely proportional to the price of underlying so if somebody has sold put option he will gain from a rise in the price of the underlying that is why it is also a long position so buy call long call or short put is a long position the opposite of that will be a short position where the person will gain when the assets price will fall so opposite will be short call selling a call option long put or purchase of a put option so that is called short position we know that the hedgers use derivatives for the protection against any adverse movement so they could use futures or they could use options when they want to protect themselves from an adverse price movement in the underlying cash commodity so they could be farmers they could be businesses or they could be individuals for example if a farmer has a product which he wants to sell 2 3 years down the line he has a risk if the price falls he has to sell at a lower price so to avoid that he wants to hedge his position so he buys a future contract sorry the farm, farmer has to sell the future contract because in future he wants to sell the product if it is a company which wants to buy raw material from the farmer they have to buy the future contract so farmer will be short future and the company who is buying raw material from the farmer will be long future so they have a predetermined price predetermined time that will hedge against any adverse movement so farmer will be hedged against downward movement of price and the buyer is hedged against upward movement of the price so that is high it is protection against higher price or lower price and as we know that cash and future prices tend to move in tandem the futures position will be profit if the price will rise that will offset to cash losses on the produce so the position remains hedged so let us say the farmer wants to sell at 100 dollar per kg certain produce okay but he is afraid that current price may fall below it so he gets into a future contract that say 3 months down the line i would like to sell my produce at this price and there is a dealer or buyer of the produce who wants to buy at 100 dollar per kg but he is afraid that the price may rise beyond that 
So he gets into a future contract with the farmer. So now if after three months the spot price or the current market price becomes say $120, right? So then the farmer has to sell the product at $100 itself. So buyer is hedged against upward movement and if the price becomes say $80 per kg now the buyer has to buy from the farmer at, at 100, kg, 100 rupees dollar per kg itself. So the farmer is protected against any downward movement. So that is how hedging works in the favor. Now let us look at a few other positions. Short sales. So this is the case when an investor believes that price of an asset is going to fall but he does not own the asset. So he short sells, he borrows the asset and sells in the market and later when the price actually fall, he can buy the product from the market and return it to the lender. So these are the steps which are involved in short sales. First an investor borrows the stock which he is going to short and deposit the cash as collateral to the broker. So he does not need to pay the whole amount for borrowing the stock he can just pay certain collateral, certain cash. Then the stock which he has borrowed is sold at that price. Since he believes that price is going to fall, he is selling at that price and expecting that he will be able to buy at a lower price. And when the price goes down as expected by the investor, then he closes the position because he is going to buy back it from the market and return it to the broker. So he is covering his short position. So buying back is called covering the short position and then he returns it to the broker or lender from his share. So if there has been a dividend payment that must be given to the lender of the security or if there has been an interest payment on the security that has to be given to the lender. So the interest earned on the collateral which has been deposited by the short seller that will be given by the broker to the short seller. So if there has been an interest which has been earned on the collateral that will be given to the short seller and if there has been any interest or dividend on the security that will be given to the lender. So in simple words the rule will be buy low sell high. So in starting the person will sell at high price and to close or cover the position he has to buy at low. Only then he will be able to make profit. Now let us look at the next topic which is leveraged position. So we know leverage is investing more than the available money with the investor. Suppose the investor has only $20 but he wants to invest in a asset of $100 and wants to gain if the price moves up. So in that case instead of paying the whole $100 he just pay the margin amount which is $20 and if it goes say $5 up which is $105 so this $5 is given to the investor and if the price falls the amount will be deducted from the margin. So that is how we are getting leverage here it is 5 times leverage. So this margin money can be borrowed from a broker. So margin is basically borrowed money taken from the broker that is used to purchase stocks. It is known as buying on margin. So this is margin loan which is borrowed fund which is taken to buy a security. Then call money rate is the interest which is to be paid on these funds which have been borrowed to purchase stocks. Then we have initial margin requirement. So this is the margin which a broker needs in the starting itself and it is usually set by the government or exchange or clearing house. This money has to be deposited with the broker. And finally because of this margin payment we have a situation of financial leverage where the investor is able to invest in n times more than the amount he already has. So this creates additional risk an additional return that is why it is called financial leverage. So we can calculate the leverage ratio. 
So leverage ratio of a margin investment will be the value of the asset and value of equity position. So this is the position of the investor. Like the example which we have taken, the value of asset was $100 and the value of equity position, the stake of the investor was just $20. So it was five times financial leverage. Now we already seen the definition of initial margin, the amount which has to be paid in starting itself to the broker. Then we have maintenance margin. So we know if the price falls or if it moves in adverse direction to the position of the investor, then margin has to be filled. Let us take the same example. If the investor has paid only $20 to the broker, and the price of the asset falls say from $100 to $90. Now the risk has increased because the investor has paid only $20 to the broker. And if it falls further, say suddenly it falls to $75. The investor has invested only $20 but his loss has reached $25. So there's a default problem arises. To avoid that, they keep a maintenance margin. So if the price falls, they give a margin call to the investor and it has to be refilled. So this is the minimum amount which is to be required in the account. So it covers for the loss if it happens. It covers the loan taken by the value of the asset. So in case the movement is adverse, it will cover for the risk. So the margin call has to be made when the price is moving in adverse direction. So this is the amount of equity in the margin when it falls below the maintenance margin. Then it will get a margin call so that it has to be brought back to the maintenance margin level. And it can be calculated as the margin call price would be the price in the starting, in this case it was $100, then initial margin which was $20 in this case, then maintenance margin. So which has to be decided in the starting itself. Now to understand it better, let us take a numerical example. So if Mr. Anthony buys 1000 shares of a stock at a price of $50 per share, but they have been purchased on margin. So only initial margin has been paid, which is 50%. So if they are buying 1000 shares at $50 per share, so instead of $50,000, they have to pay only $25,000 since the initial margin requirement is 50%. Call loan rate is 2%. So the amount will be given at 2% rate. The annual dividend is $2 per share, which has to be paid back to the lender. Then the commission is $0.01 per share. Now after one year, the stock price goes to $55. So there's a gain since the price has moved upwards. Now we have to calculate the leverage ratio and the investors return on equity that is return on margin transaction. As we know the initial margin requirement is only 50%. So the total value of the asset was $50,000 and initial margin is just 50% of that, that is 25,000. So leverage is going to be 2, leverage ratio is 2 times. Now let us look at the investors return on equity. So equity was just $25,000 which was initial margin and what was the return? The price has moved by 5%, $5 upwards, so 5 into 1000, so 5000 was the gain, but the dividend has to be paid back to the lender, so that has to be subtracted $2 per share, so minus $2000, then the commission paid was $0.01 per share, that will be $10. This $10 was the investment by the investor, so that has to be added. I'm sorry, this dividend was a gain to the investor, so that has to be added in this 5000. This was capital gain, this was dividend gain, so both of the gains are to be added. They are income to the investor. And the another cost was the interest. Since only $25,000 were paid by the investor, rest $25,000 were borrowed on the margin. So interest paid was 2%. So 2% was the interest which was paid for that year. 
for twenty five thousand dollars. So twenty five thousand into two percent, which will be five hundred dollars. So that was another cost. So we have to reduce that minus five hundred dollars. So we get five thousand plus two thousand is seven thousand. So it is six thousand four hundred eighty. Yeah, it has to be twenty dollars since the commission has to be paid on both buying and selling. So that is how it is six thousand four eighty divided by twenty five thousand ten. So this is our return on equity. So let us check once again. The leverage ratio was two. The total purchase price was fifty thousand twenty five thousand, which was half of it was the margin paid initially. And the remaining amount, twenty-five thousand, was borrowed. The commission paid was ten dollar for buying and ten dollar for selling. So total equity investment made by Mr. Anthony is going to be twenty-five thousand ten. Since commission paid in the starting has to be added, this will not be added. This is to be deducted in the end. And the value of the stock was fifty-five thousand. The gain will be fifty-five thousand minus fifty thousand minus ten dollar. So this was the commission paid in the end. Four nine nine zero. Now the dividend paid was two thousand. Interest paid is two percent of twenty five thousand, which is borrowed. So five hundred dollar. Commission on the sale is again ten dollar. This is on the selling side. So total gain will be this four nine nine zero, where we have already subtracted the commission on buy side. Then the dividend, which is to be added, the interest had to be subtracted, and this ten dollar is commission on the sale of the stock. So this has to be subtracted once again. So ten dollar has been subtracted here, ten dollar here. So we wrote twenty dollar. So six thousand four eighty is the total gain, and that will be divided by twenty five thousand and ten. So nineteen point nine five is the return on investment or return on equity. So roughly we can calculate that total ten percent was the price appreciation. So fifty to fifty five was the appreciation in the price. Fifty dollar to fifty five dollar that is ten percent. Then two percent was the dividend. So total gain was twelve percent, and there was a leverage ratio of two times. So we should have got twenty four percent return on equity, but it is less than twenty four because of the interest we have paid and the commissions we have paid. So if there is a case where interest is zero and commission is zero, we are going to have twenty four percent as return on equity. Now let us take one more example. Where the investor wants to purchase a stock which is trading at fifty dollar per share, the initial margin requirement here is forty percent, and the minimum maintenance margin requirement is of twenty percent. So we already know the formula. We can calculate the margin call. So margin call price at which margin call is made is equal to initial price, which is fifty dollar, into One minus initial margin that was forty percent or point four divided by one minus minimum margin that is point two or twenty percent. So that is how we get fifty into point six divided by point eight. It is going to be thirty seven and half dollar. So that is the margin call price. So this is how we have just put the values in the formula. We get thirty seven and half. Let us move to the next slide. these are the terms we have already been introduced to them bid price the price at which dealers buy the security so suppose the dealer has given a quote bid offer as say 100 100.5 so this is the price at which dealer is willing to buy so if there is an investor who wants to sell he has to sell at bid price so dealer would buy at this price from the investor if the investor has to buy he has to buy at offer price so as we have seen that dealer will sell at 100.5 buy at 100 so he is going to make this 0.5 gain which is bid offer spread or bid ask spread ask price is the price at which dealer sell the security and the spread between them is bid ask spread now when we send an order there could be three types of instructions related to the order 
the first is execution instruction so which is how to trade whether the order should get executed at the market price or whether the order should be executed at a limit price that is if we are buying we should buy at max a certain price or if we are selling we put a limit that we cannot sell below a point so it could be market order or limit order so that is related to the execution of the instruction the other type is validity of the instruction so the order could be good till day so it can stay in the market for the whole day or it could be immediate or cancel where if the price which is mentioned in the order is not achieved in the market then it will immediately cancel the order so this is validity instruction and third is clearing instruction so this is the instruction in the order about the settlement of the order for example if it is a long trade that the investor bought in the starting and sold in the end or it could be a sale order where the investor already had the asset he wants to sell at certain price or it could be short sale where the investor does not have the security he wants to sell by borrowing it and he can buy it later and return the security so that is the clearing instruction in the order now let us look at these kind of instructions in detail first execution instructions so the order could be a market order where whatever best price is available in the market the order will get executed so the price is not given in the order whatever is the best price available the order will get executed at that then we have a limit order in which we are describing a minimum price on the sell order or maximum price on the buy order suppose we sell a buy order and it is a limit order we mention the price say 10 dollar so th this is the price which we are willing to pay to buy a stock at max so if the stock is available in the market at say 9 dollar the order will get immediately executed at 9 dollar suppose it is available at 10.5 dollar the order will not get executed it will wait till it falls below 10 dollar so that is our limit price for buying similarly if we want to sell suppose we do not want to sell below Twelve dollar. So if the price in the market is say eleven dollar, the order will wait. It will not get executed. As soon as it touches twelve dollar, the order will get executed. Then we can have standing limit order. So limit order that are waiting in line to be executed, which are called standing limit order. Then we can have all or nothing order, in which if the whole quantity is filled, suppose we wanted to buy. at 10 dollar limit price 100 shares but in the market suppose 50 shares are available at 10 dollar and then 50 shares are available at 11 dollar so in case of all or nothing order the order will not get executed since we are not getting full 100 quantity filled at Ten dollar price, the order will remain completely unfilled since it is all or nothing. Then we can have hidden order, in which an investor wants to trade large order, but he does not want to reveal the order to the market in order to reduce the market impact cost. So these are hidden order. Now let us look at the validity of the order. So we can have day order. which will expire at the end of the day if they are not filled throughout the day at the end of the day trade they will expire then there are trade which are good till cancelled so they will remain until they are filled or cancelled then we have immediate or cancel so as soon as the order reaches the market if they do not get the right price they are immediately cancelled either they are filled immediately or cancelled immediately they are also called fill or kill orders then there are good on close orders which are filled at the end of trading day so whatever is the price at the end of trading day they are executed at that price then we have stop loss order so they are used to protect profit and limit losses 
For example, if an investor is purchasing a stock for sixty dollar, and he wants to sell out the position if it falls to fifty one dollar, so he doesn't want a loss more than nine dollar, he can put a stop sell order at fifty one. So the order will get executed if it is reaching the price of fifty one dollar or below. So as soon as it touches this, the order get executed, and the security is sold. So it is stop loss order. Similarly, we can have stop buy order. Which is placed above the current market price. So there could be two situations under which investor may want stop buy order when the investor has a short sell his stocks. So if it moves above certain price, then order will get executed since the investor wants to minimize his losses. Another case could be when he is waiting for the trend to change and he is confident about the valuation, but still he wants to see the market movement. so where it is moving so even in that case the investor will buy at a price above certain order so it is stop buy order so if it moves say above 10 dollar you buy that now let us move to the third type which is clearing instruction so the trader is instructing in the order how to clear and settle a trade So, for example, if it is a sell order, the clearing instruction is whether it is a short sale or long sale. If it is a long sale, that indicates that the investor already had the security which he wants to sell. The short sale that he is going to buy back later. Short sale is where the broker is confirming that security can be borrowed because it's a short sale. And in the long sale, the broker must confirm that the security can be delivered. That the investor already had the security and it can be delivered so it will be a long sale so now let us move to the next slide we talk about two kinds of market primary market and secondary market so primary market is a place where sale of newly issued security takes place so suppose a company wants to raise funds from the market as an equity so they are issuing shares through an ipo which is initial public offer so they are going first time to the market so money is paid from the shareholders to the company so company is receiving money from the shareholders and similarly if it is a bond issue then the company will receive money from bond bond holders so this is primary market and there could be secondary market where the securities are being traded among the investors so the company is not gaining or losing any cash but there are different traders who are buying or selling securities so it is not making any difference to the company directly so the secondary markets could be stock exchange for example national stock exchange or nasdaq etc so they provide a place where the traders can buy or sell they provide liquidity and value information so at any point in time we can find out what is the price and there is a liquidity so we can execute the order at any point in time then we can have seasoned offerings or secondary issues secondary issues are new shares issued by the company whose shares are already trading in the market so it could be further public offer so that is after ipo has already been issued now let us look at them in detail the public offering in a primary market so a new issue is always sold with the help of an investment bank so which is also called an underwriter so the terminologies which are used in this process are indication of interest that is an investment bank finds investors who agree to buy part of the issue so these are not actual orders but the investment banks who has the responsibility to sell the securities they find out certain investors who agree to buy certain shares on a certain price so they get an idea this is indication of the interest so these are not actual orders then there's a book building process which is a price discovery method the investment bank wants to find out what should be the actual price of a share so for that the company gives a range it does not fix a price but it gives a range from which they get to know what should be the ideal range so we have a book runner which is also a book builder which is basically running the book for price discovery then we have accelerated book building 
which occurs when the securities are to be issued very quickly. Then we have underwritten offering in which an investment bank helps a company with a security issuance where an underwritten offering is given under which the investment bank says that he agrees to buy the entire issue at a certain price which is already agreed upon if the issue is undersubscribed. So if the investors are not showing interest, they are not buying the shares, then the investment bank promises to buy the unsold portion. So this is the underwriting. The second mechanism is best efforts mechanism in which the investment bank will help in selling out the issue but it will not purchase it. It will give its best effort but the if the issue is undersubscribed then the investment bank is not obligated to buy the unsold portion which is different from the underwriting. So the commissions for the both will differ because of these conditions. Now let us look at another mechanism in primary market which could be private placement. We have seen in the public offering the shares or bonds are issued to the public but there could be private placement where the securities are sold to certain qualified investors. So these private placements do not require any disclosure as compared to the public placements. Then we can have shelf registration where the securities are issued over time as and when the company needs cash and when the markets are favorable when they are getting good pricing. So this is called shelf registration. Then we can have a dividend reinvestment plan where the shareholders use the dividend to buy new shares. The so dividends are issued by the company but they are used by the investors to buy new shares. So dividends are reinvested in the company. Then we can have rights offering in which the existing shareholders are given the right to buy new shares at discount. That company wants to raise further capital but if the company wants to give certain profit to the existing shareholder they gives them right to buy new shares at a discount price. So this is rights offering. So now let us look at the next topic which is kinds of market. Broadly we have code driven, order driven market and brokered market. So let us look at the code driven market first. For example the call market. So these are the markets where stocks are only traded at specific time intervals. So trading does not happen at all time. So there are market buyers and sellers who are going to determine the price but the execution is going to happen only a certain fixed intervals. For example every one hour the trade will happen where all the orders of buyers and sellers will match. So this is called call markets. Then we have continuous market where the trade can occur anytime when the market is open. So orders are being sent by both buyers and sellers and matching keeps happening. So price could be set by the way of auction or the dealer's bid ask spread. So it could be of either type but it is a continuous market where trade can occur at any point in time. In code driven market the price is determined by bid ask spread of the market makers. So these market makers or dealers they give bid ask spread. So there is a guarantee of execution of order. So they give you bid ask spread say 100, 100.5 so as soon as buyer or seller is interested he can send order at this price. He wants to buy he can buy at 100.5 if he wants to sell he can sell at 100. So order execution is guaranteed. So this is called dealer's market or price driven market or even OTC over the counter market. Now let us look at the order driven market where the orders of both buyers and sellers are shown showing the price at which they are willing to buy or sell a stock and the quantity at which they are willing to buy and sell. And then once we have orders of both buyers and sellers with price and quantity, price quantity of buyer, price and quantity of seller, then order matching will happen according to certain rules. So we have order matching rules which establish a precedence hierarchy. So we have price priority which is highest priority is given to the highest bid and lowest ask. For example, we are going to have this way 100, 100.5. This is bid, this is offer or ask. And there could be again quantity. Suppose 
50 quantity at this price and 50 quantity at this price then we can have some other quantity at a lower price so bid could be 98 and here it could be some other quantity say 101 price could be 102 here it could be 97 so 100 is the highest bid and 105 is the lowest offer so highest bid and lowest ask is given highest priority so they will be executed first so they are in the top of the order book and secondary precedence rule if the price are same then the priority is given on the basis of non-hidden orders the orders which are visible non-hidden and which have arrived first so time is the second rule in the precedence then we have trade pricing rules which are used to determine the price one could be uniform pricing rule that if all the orders on the same price then the volume would be considered and it could be discriminatory pricing rule where the limit price of the order which has arrived first is used as a trade price so this is trade pricing rule now let us look at the third kind of market which is brokered market so this is the marketplace where such services are offered to buyers and sellers by some intermediary which is a broker so the services of a counterparty are most valuable when the securities are illiquid and valuable for example rare paintings real estate etc where the information may not be available to buyer or seller they find out an intermediary where they can describe their requirements and the matching is done by the intermediary so that is called brokered market so based on the market information availability it can be divided into two categories pre-trade transparent and post-trade transparent so pre-trade transparent is if the investor has beforehand information that is pre-trade information regarding the quotes and the orders and the post-trade transparent is if he has post-trade information regarding the sizes and the prices after the trade so that is two kinds of market information so now let us move to the next topic which is the characteristics of a well-functioning market so how does we find out that the markets are well functioning so it will include providing returns to the investor they are giving credit or funds to individuals who have credibility and if they are managing the risk properly then they will be complete market and they will be called operationally inefficient if the execution is easy and a lower cost so trading costs are lower for example bid ask spread is lower the commission is lower so if somebody wants to buy and sell he or she will be able to buy and sell immediately without much commission and much spread the second is informationally efficient when the all information which is publicly available is already priced in the market price then the system is informationally efficient so a well-functioning market has financial intermediaries who are going to provide venues for trade the sub, they are going to supply the liquidity and they are going to manage risk in terms of insurance and the other services are provided by banks advisory etc so if the markets are operationally efficient the security prices will be more informationally efficient so if the bid ask spread is low commission is low then prices will reflect the more accurate value of the security because the low trading cost encourage trading based on the new information if the new information has come in it will immediately change the price if the commission and bid ask spread are lower otherwise the price change will not be less than these now let us move to the next slide which is the objectives of market regulation so markets need to be regulated because of these reasons first is protecting uninformed and unsophisticated members from fraud and theft we may have uninformed traders or investors or unsophisticated members who may not have access to appropriate models etc so they should be protected from any fraud and theft then if an investor thinks that an insider trading is happening then his confidence in the market will be affected then they will not be motivated to trade in the market since they are not relying upon the prices completely they will quit the market 
So in order to maintain the liquidity and the interest in the market, the regulators need to ensure that there is no insider trading. Then if the cost paid to obtain necessary information is high, then markets will not be informationally efficient. If collection of the information itself is cumbersome or pricey, then people may not be interested to collect that information and they are not interested in the small gains because cost is already high. So that is why the market regulators should ensure the information is easily accessible and at a very low cost. Another objective is to make sure that parties honor their obligation. If there is a default, then the party should honor the obligation. Another objective is to protect the investor's interest in the market. They impose common financial reporting standard. If all the companies are following common standards, then it is easy for an investor to understand the condition of a company. So that has to be ensured by the market regulation. Another objective is that they will ensure that minimum level of capital is maintained and the minimum standards of the competency are followed. So in order to ensure them, we need to have proper market regulation. So that has brought us to the end of the topic.